the new Atlantis of Lord Bacon. We have to place this type of thinking within some type of historical reference frame. We cannot estimate a work of the 17th century by the concepts of our own time. We must therefore consider it in the background of the conditions which produced it and the pressures uh, which brought it forth into objectivity. In the early years of the 17th century, an extraordinary phenomenon burst upon Europe. And that phenomenon was the Society of the Rosy Cross. This is probably one of the great mysteries of literature and perhaps one of the great mysteries of history. This society issued a series of proclamations of which the Fama and Confessio Fraternitatis are the most famous. These manifestos announced a reformation of Europe, a universal reformation, in fact, a major change in the thought and life of mankind. That such works could come into existence meant that already what we call the Reformation had accomplished a large part of its labor. Man's mind was liberated from the tremendous orthodoxy that dominated the medieval world. At the same time, a series of rather brilliant intellectuals were experimenting on the fringe of what we call today philosophic humanism. Now, I'm well aware that the modern trends in humanism may be very materialistic, but such was not the original trend in the hands of these men, most of whom were devout and sincere, God-loving human beings. Humanism to them meant the beginning of the recognition of human dignity, that the individual was important. We are told that in the so-called medieval period, the individual simply did not exist. What we understand today by humanitarianism had no real equivalent in those times. The, each individual struggling for his own survival, advanced his destiny regardless of cost to other individuals. Now, the tyranny of success was probably as severe then as it begins to appear that it is to be severe in the immediate future of our own time. Everything was sacrificed to a tremendous pressure for power. When humanism began to break, through this barrier. Its primary interest was in the dignity of man himself. But this dignity was built upon classical foundations. The humanists derived their primary inspiration from Plato and Aristotle, and the great classical thinkers of uh, Southern Europe and North Africa. It had not occurred to these first humanists to break the ties with the past. What rather they hoped to accomplish was to bring about a restoration of the best of the past, to use man's long journey as a way of introducing him into a new way of interpreting uh, the available information and correcting the fallacies of the existing condition. There was no decided or distinct break with the past. There was rather a reinterpretation of past events. We can sense this in all of the utopian uh, writings, for they have this one common uh, theme, namely that regardless of how they sought to uh, create the concept of a better commonwealth, they always traveled to some distant place by one experience or another, being lost at sea or shipwrecked or lost in deserts or whatever the case may be, they always came in the end to a fair place 
that had existed for a long time. Somewhere in the distant parts of the world was the ideal community. It had not been discovered because its location was remote and far from the ordinary courses of human trade and traffic. This ideal city, however, stood with its battlements, its walls, its moats, or whatever seemed to be the proper uh, equipment of the time. The principal difference was that it was a well-regulated city. It was Nuremberg or Heidelberg or London or any one of the cities of the time, but reformed, enlightened. The obvious weaknesses and corruptions of society corrected, and a better and more progressive attitude uh, reigned in this mysterious and distant city. Uh, the practical foundation for many of the utopias seems to have been the, re the development of the cantonal republics of Switzerland. The Swiss had already come to a rather advanced sociological state, while much of Europe still languished in its own uh, despotisms. The Swiss cantonal system, with its tolerances, with its cooperative attitude toward life, was of great interest to all practical thinkers of the time. And there is no doubt that the Switzerland served as an archetype for a number of the utopian productions. But this was not the full story. The full story was actually that man, looking about him for the first time, free from the oppression of the existing patterns, began to examine these patterns, find fault with them, observe how they could be changed, corrected, or improved, and dared to state what he had discovered in some articulate way. He could no longer be burned at the stake for suggesting that something was wrong with his way of life. This newfound intellectual freedom produced a wave of rather progressive types of work, many of them extremely interesting. Of course, the classic of all the utopias is Moore's Utopia. And in this work, we find the beginning of a whole sequence of reflections upon existing evils. Reflections, however, that did not go sour, but rather took the challenge of the time and began to contemplate how the individual would live if he had something to say about the way he lived. Instead of being a victim of an oppressive feudalism, it was now his turn to do a little daydreaming. And these daydreams became quite interesting and articulate, and in many instances undoubtedly contributed to the rise of the Western democratic concept of living. I think we can say of Moore's Utopia that it suffered from the common ailments of these books, namely that it was rather stuffy. Uh, stuffy in the sense that if we read it today, we would not think it very progressive. We would feel that it was dogmatic, that it had about it too much of regimentation, that actually the individual uh, seeking a new freedom from one corruption fell under slavery to reform itself. So that instead of coming to liberty, he came to a classification, uh, which also is of some disturbance to people today wonder if a highly socialized system developing here would gradually destroy most of the individuality and freedom of expression of our modern way of life. Actually, of course, the authors of the utopias were not afflicting or burdening anybody. They created their characters, their cities, and their rules, and these rules never passed beyond the pages of their own books. But in spite of the restrictions and limitations of perspective that we might expect and must accept, we see that these people were working primarily uh, toward a, a concept of universal education, a concept of universal suffrage, a concept of e equality, of opportunity, of equity, and of the rights of man before the law and court of his time. Each in its own way was a proclamation of a Bill of Rights.
Each author found, as he proceeded, that his city became ever more difficult to govern. Therefore, he had to continue to do what we have done, make new laws to maintain old ones, until his utopia was as law-ridden as many of the communities he sought to reform. This experience we also have inherited from him. But in the, ba in the main, he was looking for something, and he was determined to find it. And his books had tremendous appeal. When Moore's Utopia was issued uh, with the idea that there was a mysterious island on which this wonderful city stood, th hundreds of people went to sea captains and tried to arrange for passage to this imaginary city. They felt that regardless of any other situation, they would rather, rather live there than any place they knew about. This led to some confusion, but gradually the pressure subsided and men began to realize that this utopia was an inner experience, something that man was seeking in the form of a hidden empire within his own consciousness. The next of these interesting utopian works, of course, was Campanella's City of the Sun. This was the work of a theologian, but he was well persecuted by religion for his efforts also to create the concept of a way of life which was harmonious with God and fair to mankind. Uh, Campanella recognized that ecclesiastical tyranny was no less than that of the civil courts, and that it was not much different whether the individual be dominated by the clergy or by the aristocracy. This, as you can well understand, was not particularly pleasing to the church, and it uh, moved in upon Campanella and treated him pretty badly. But the principle involved was the same, that this escape uh, from domination also had to mean escape from superstition. It had to be release from spiritual authority, which in partnership with temporal authority um, afflicted the common man. So Campanella's City of the Sun was also a rather theological community rather suggestive in many respects of a well-ordered monastery, but at the same time there was in it this desire of man to find practical ways of creating a solution to war, a solution to hate, a solution to fear. And in the beginning years of the 17th century, those problems which again loom large in our thinking were beginning to really dominate the popular mind. Probably the smuggest and most delightful of the utopias is that of the German theologian Johann Valentin André, whose book Christianopolis uh, was highly uh, uh, influenced by the culture of Switzerland. Of course, André was a devout Lutheran, and he could not for a moment support the, the uh, religious convictions of Calvinist Switzerland. But at the same time, he admitted in some of his writings that he regretted that he was unable uh, to accept wholeheartedly the Swiss way or go there and live, because in many respects he admired it greatly. But out of his entire experience, he began to develop uh, a more or less Protestant theological utopia in which, guided by the essential principles of Lutheranism, there was to be this new community dedicated to the equality and uh, fundamental security of men. Uh, Luther, of course, uh, cannot be blamed for André's concepts, but in his own way, Luther also, during his lifetime, expressed many of these same principles. And uh, therefore, André undoubtedly drew much inspiration from the writings of Luther himself. In this commonwealth, uh, which uh, André envisioned, there was considerable emphasis upon the economic state of man. Uh, the others were more philosophical, more abstract. But André, who was much interested in labor movements in Europe, even in his own, own time, and was one of the first to develop a cooperative to take care of and protect the widows and orphans of laboring people. Uh, 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 Andre was deeply 
concerned with a utopia in which everyone had the right to work, the right to have what he earned, the right to build a way of life which brought him personal security, and furthermore, if his industry was uh, sincere and intelligent, that he had a certain right to the enjoyments of leisure, of reading, of thought, and of the general improvement of his mind. Uh, Andre did not unite with the popular mind that reserved all intellectual pursuits for a small group. Uh, Andre's thinking, uh, the good city, the city of Christ, was not only a wonderful community, but it was in substance a great school. It was a place of universal enlightenment in which individuals learned by living and lived by the learning which they had uh, gradually accumulated. So it was a kind of city of proletariat philosophers, uh, philosophers that uh, were not scholastic or academic, academic, but were thoughtful persons to whom security brought the right to be thoughtful, the privilege to think and the mind could be relieved from the very great emergencies of daily existence. This type of thinking also uh, permeated other utopian productions of that period. Now this brings us to the subject of the New Atlantis, which was produced by an entirely different type of person. This uh, work, in fact all of the others included, seem to have risen from this idea of a universal reformation of mankind. This reformation was the very uh, pro uh, pronouncement of all the utopias, that a new kind of life was opening for man. This new life was a related somewhat also to the Western Hemisphere, to the, ev to the development of a great new country, where plantations could be established, where men could escape from the perils and miseries of the old world and build in the new world a way of life closer to their heart's desire. It is very probable that uh, the Rosicrucian manifestos in the utopias were both to a degree keyed to the development of the Western Hemisphere. For here at last seemed to be an opportunity to break away uh, from the traditions of the old world and go forth in search of freedom of conscience, freedom of worship, freedom of opportunity by which the individual could escape from the decadence of early 17th century Europe. The most interesting of these works to us is Lord Bacon's because of the tremendous implications that are involved in the book and which surround it. We can therefore really regret that it remained a fragment, that as far as his lordship was concerned, the work was never finished. We might note, however, that in 1660, what was considered to be or advanced as the continuation of the New Atlantis was published. It was published under initials only, and the author of the second section or second part has never with certainty been identified. Studying it, however, there seems to be some question as to whether the second part shall be considered a legitimate extension of the original, or whether it was a fabrication of later date by some ambitious person who sought to expand the earlier account. There are two schools of thinking on this, and both sides have considerable armament, but the matter has never been actually settled. We also realize uh, from our own thinking and studying that Lord Bacon was almost certainly deeply and closely involved in the rise of the Rosicrucian uh, society in England. We also have reason to suspect that the society was actually founded in England, although uh, the manifestos would attempt to move it to Germany. In addition, we remember the statements made uh, by Burton in his Anatomy of Melancholy, a very famous nostalgic book of the period, uh, where 
Burton distinctly identifies Bacon with André, the German theologian who did the Christianopolis. As a footnote to a quotation, Burton writes, Johann Valentin André, comma, Lord Verulam. Well, of course, André, he was never Lord Verulam, and uh, the relationship to Bacon is inevitable. There is also much proof and many uh, documents to sustain the fact that Bacon and André and Campanella were in communication with each other. And it is quite possible that a good many of these utopian productions arose in a common factory of the minds, uh, inspired by a definite purpose. And that purpose was to support and advance the Universal Reformation as expounded in the Fama and Confessio Fraternitatis. In any event, the New Atlantis has been tied in many ways to the Rosicrucian problem. John Hayden, who wrote about 1660 and claimed to have a considerable knowledge of the Rosicrucians, published the New Atlantis as a Rosicrucian fable, changing only a few words and introducing the word Rosy Cross in two or three places where it is not in Bacon's original text. Now, this has caused a considerable amount of controversy also. In 1660, we must assume that the Lord Bacon's works were rather well known in England. In fact, we know that most of them have passed through several editions, and that uh, the Royal Society, which was based upon Bacon's original concepts, was beginning to take shape and influence English thinking. Therefore, we cannot assume that the English people were unaware of the New Atlantis. And it is more or less foolish to also assume that Hayden could have hoped that his plagiarization would pass undetected. There seems to be more reason to suppose that either Hayden himself believed that the New Atlantis was a Rosicrucian fable and therefore felt justified in making these changes, or else he was party to some knowledge and actually knew that Lord Bacon's fable was intended to be a Rosicrucian work. These questions are probably over the period of centuries we won't answer, but at least they're worth thinking about as we proceed. So we come now to the New Atlantis itself, and I think we have an interesting project on our hands. Here is the first edition of the New Atlantis, published in 1627 as the appendix to Lord Bacon's Silva Silvarum, or the Natural History of Winds in Ten Centuries. This is part of his great work, the Instauratio Magna, or the Textbook of Universal Knowledge. And uh, the New Atlantis is appended to this as a fragment. This is its first appearance in print. It is described on the title page, The New Atlantis, a work unfinished, written by the Right Honorable Francis Lord Verulam, Viscount St. Alban. And the uh, lower part of the title page, there is a rather interesting vignette. This vignette shows the figure of time, now presented almost in the form of Pan, but as an aged man, with the lower members resembling those of a goat, uh, carrying also the scythe, accompanied by the hourglass, and drawing a female figure from a cavern, which is to be found at the viewer's left of the picture. Uh, the uh, Latin motto which surrounds this central device reads that in time all that is hidden shall be made known. This is a rather interesting cryptic title page and uh, is found only on very few books. This particular woodblock, uh, there's an interesting thing that uh, perhaps would interest you in connection with it. This particular woodblock does occur on some other books. I have traced it on an English cookbook, uh, which uh, is quite intriguing. This cookbook was published about the same time as this book, and theoretically, the printers had these devices available. The cookbook in question came out in two editions in the same year, 
One edition carried this in this little vignette. The other did not. Uh, they were both published the same year, uh, about in the middle 1630s or thereabout. Uh, a copy of the book without the vignette can be bought in the book trade for about $25. The only copy I have seen listed of the edition with the vignette of the same year was priced at 700 pounds. The text is the same. No one seems to know why. The answer seems to be, at least, that all through this literature of this period, we have what might be termed landmarks, uh, peculiar markings to identify or signify things of importance. I suspect strongly that if we went through the two editions of the aforementioned cookbook, we would find that they are not printed from the same type although they were printed in the same year. I think we would also find that the copy that contains the vignette is ciphered, that is, has a code running through it. The other copy does not. A number of persons are probably aware of this, and one by one the available copies of that particular edition have disappeared from public uh, availability. Of course, there's always a chance one would show up somewhere but uh, the demand for that edition is far greater than the demand for the uncoded edition. Therefore, uh, having seen this type of thing happen again and again, we begin to wonder if there is not some uh, meaning that we should look for where this coding appears or where this monument is raised upon the title of a book. In this case, I think we are entitled to look for something, and I do think that we don't have to look very far to find it. Uh, one interesting point, I think, occurs in the preface to the reader that is signed by Dr. Raleigh, who was Lord Bacon's chaplain and secretary. And he gives us just a little clue uh, to the new Atlantis. Remember now that apparently the New Atlantis is a fictional work also, dealing with one of these mysterious utopias. This one apparently located somewhere mid-Pacific, halfway between the coast, the western coast of America and the coast of Asia. But in any event, uh, uh, Raleigh writes, This fable my lord devised, to the end that he might exhibit therein a model or description of a college instituted for the interpreting of nature and the producing of great and marvelous works for the benefits of man under the name of Solomon's House or the College of the Six Days' Work. And even so far his lordship hath proceeded as to finish that part. Certainly the model is more vast and high than can possibly be imitated in all things. Notwithstanding, most things therein are within man's power to effect. His lordship thought also in this present fable to have composed a frame of laws, or of the best state, or mold of a commonwealth. But foreseeing it would be a long work, his desire to the collecting of the natural history diverted him, and he preferred many degrees before it. The, um, this opens a very interesting point because we know that it was upon the model of this New Atlantis College that the Royal Society of England was later founded. And Spratt in his history of the Royal Society definitely declares that the inspiration of it was derived from Bacon's College of the Six Days' Work. We also know that Newton... Uh, and uh, many other important men of his time, scientists and uh, architects, leaders of thought, belong to a group called the Society of the Unknown Philosophers. This has likewise been traced, and we find that it arose among the same group that later integrated the Royal Society. Thus, out of the uh, College of the Six Days' Work, an actual physical institution did ultimately spring. Uh, 
but this institution was only a fragment of the original invention. It was evident from this uh, preface of Raleigh's that Bacon had in mind creating the archetype or pattern of a great system of education, and that therefore it was not to be regarded merely as a fable, nor even as a utopia in the popular sense of that time. It was not just a story of men seeking for a better world. It had to do with something uh, which in the development of the account uh, we are impelled to assume already had an existence. And that like several of these other utopias, these distant places hidden from men implied perhaps a secret society or a secret association of persons that actually did exist, as in the case of the guilds, where the concept of a social commonwealth existed long before it burst through to become a political equation in European history. In any event, this is the, uh, the idea of a great college or school that was to be built. The next point, I think, is perhaps more dramatic than any of the others because it reveals an extraordinary knowledge which Lord Bacon possessed. He causes his mariners to start out from the coast of Peru, which is a peculiar place for them to start from. They sailed from Peru in a westerly direction, and after a time met adverse winds and were unable to proceed on their journey. Uh, they then were favored by winds from the south that drove them northward. And where, or in what locality, we are assumed to suppose that uh, the discovery of this mysterious island of the wise men uh, took place, we have no way of actually estimating. Various opinions have been advanced on this also. Perhaps this supposed area was somewhat near to what we now know as the Hawaiian Islands. Perhaps what was really implied was some of the primitive cultures of the South Pacific. In any event, several points are of interest, particularly to Americanists who have been working in this area. The principal thinking is based also upon certain words used by Lord Bacon which in his time were meaningless or entirely beyond the general uh, comprehension of the day. Some of the points that he makes in here were not finally clarified until the present century. Yet he seems to have had some basic knowledge about these older uh, places. For example, in part one place in the New Atlantis, uh, we have this sentence. Yet so much is true that the said country of Atlantis, as well as that of Peru, then called Coya, as that of Mexico, then named Tarambo, were mighty or proud kingdoms in arms, shipping, and riches. Now this is uh, more than just a guess. In some way, uh, Bacon was in possession of certain facts. The Kolua, which is the, the present pronunciation of the word which Bacon calls Koya, was the name for an ancient uh, level of classical and cultural attainment of almost prehistoric Peru. This was not known in England or anywhere else at the time of Bacon. But it is quite possible... Uh, that this particular group of Koya, symbolizing a prehistoric Peruvian culture, uh, fits into some of our modern archaeological needs in our own present-day effort to trace uh, the antiquity of Peruvian culture. For here was one of the very great centers of ancient Western uh, culture. Uh, Point Dexter, in his study of the Inca, has also noted that in uh, the description of one of the great personages of Solomon's house, 
it is described by Bacon that he carry uh, that he wore a turban like hat or cap in which was placed a stalk of wheat. This stalk of wheat occurs in ancient Indian pictures of the Incas, and the great leaders of the Peruvian culture used the stalk of wheat as a scepter. Now, we don't know how Bacon might have known this. It is possible that some of these records were brought back. But he seems to be working from something more than just uh, a fabled interest in a situation. There is some possibility, though we have never been able to pin down the facts with certainty, that Bacon was with Drake on one of his voyages to the Western world. It is also possible uh, that Bacon, because of his extraordinary connections, was able to do something that no other European before him had attempted to do and no one since his time had thought of doing. Namely, that Bacon was aware that a great system of culture, including mystery schools and initiation into secret orders did exist in the Western Hemisphere prior to the advent of the colonization scheme. And also that these cultures had reached a very high degree of attainment in Peru and in Mexico. Is he telling us then in the story of his new Atlantis that he has actually learned that this mysterious college of the six days' work actually existed in the Western Hemisphere prior to the advent of the Spaniards. Was this wonderful city of Mexico, for example, which Cortes described as the most beautiful city in all the world, the Venice of the Western Hemisphere, was this city actually also a great cultural center? Did it possess some institution which could have inspired the idea of Solomon's house and also inspired the general concept of Bacon's mysterious island of the blessed, which he called Ben Salem, or in the larger sense, the son of peace? This particular possibility that Bacon was aware that an ancient cultural foundation existed here uh, may have an interesting bearing on our general thinking. The New Atlantis also makes another point concerning the Old Atlantis, which is important. It states in here that the Old Atlantis was not destroyed by earthquakes, as some of the Greek writers had presumed, but that it was destroyed by water and that this water did not completely inundate the land, but it did rise to a considerable height for a time, possibly due to great tidal waves or some other uh, catastrophe, and that this water rising to a height of 30 or 40 feet destroyed those living in lower areas who were unable to escape its devastating uh, action. But some did escape and did hide themselves uh, in higher ground and therefore did survive the catastrophe. Bacon takes the attitude uh, that this also occurred while the Atlanteans had sent a great fleet against the Athenian states and that this fleet prob probably either destroyed during the journey or ultimately unable to return. Uh, made no effort to uh, restore the ancient land, but were either exterminated elsewhere or absorbed into the cultures of other people. But at about the same time, Tarambo, the then ancient city of Mexico, also then led an expedition against the island of Ben Salem and threatened to exterminate the wonderful city where stood the College of the Six Days' Work. This expedition also failed not because the people of Ben Salem destroyed the invaders, but because the invaders returning to their own land after having taken an oath not to further disturb the peace of this fabled city,
were later destroyed by the wrath of God in the form of floods and other natural disasters. This concept does agree, in some part at least, with the records that we have here in the Western Hemisphere of the destruction of the continent of the Islands of Mud. For in the uh, Aztec and Maya chronicles of the destruction of the ancient land, the uh, same idea as Bacon himself gives us is developed, namely that these mudlands sank or were brought so low that they could no longer sustain habitation, that, the, uh, that these low areas were turned into great bogs of mud, and that uh, in this disaster the numerous persons perished, but that others were saved and did escape to other areas where they built a new world. Bacon seems to imply that what we call the American Indians are survivors of this deluge. And that is the reason why the country was so sparsely populated, because these peoples were only remnants of an older people that had perished a long time ago. And uh, Bacon also suggests something that the modern anthropologist is very suspicious of, namely that the, uh, the so-called North American Indian culture on this hemisphere was probably not much more than a thousand years older than the advent of the Spaniards and other colonists. All this fits together, you can make something of it or not as you please, but it fits together to show that the author was working with a much more serious intent than might generally be supposed. It is in this work also that Bacon muses the significant line, the new Atlantis, which is America. And therefore he uses the whole concept in his writing to suggest that the American continent received the survivors of the ancient Atlantean deluge, that part of this continent itself was involved in that destruction, and that uh, gradually uh, a process of the extending and expanding of a new culture here was underway when the colonists arrived. And uh, we have a number of works uh, that seem to sustain this thinking, because uh, at least one Americanist has taken the attitude that if the colonists had been another hundred years getting here, they could never have taken the continent. There was a tremendous uh, rising of culture in all three divisions of America, North, Central, and South. And this culture, had it grown somewhat stronger, it would have reached empire and dominion in its own right. Therefore, perhaps it was a rising culture, uh, restoring itself from an older and previous destruction. It has always been among esotericists uh, a habit to refer to the American Indian as an Atlantean, and this would actually uh, support Bacon's position, although our thinking was unknown in his day. With all this, however, I think we have to be very careful that we do not uh, become too much involved uh, in the uh, geographical, geological implications of the story unless we want to stay there for a while and work with it, because certainly there is possibility in this direction. But there is also possibility that Bacon used his Atlantis fable almost precisely as Plato had before him. Plato, of course, in his preparation of the Atlantis account, also ends in the middle of a sentence. The, his concept of the Atlantis is also a work unfinished, just as Lord Bacon's was. And there may be intent or reason for this. It may be in truth that uh, the stories both deal with an unfinished product that only time can finish as only time can place the capstone on the mysterious pyramid on the United States seal. In any event, there are several possibilities in the Atlantic fable. The one thing that we know is that psychologically the past or that which has gone before in the life of an individual or in the collective folk consciousness of a people is gradually submerged by present events. Therefore, psychologically, 
of the vast tradition of a people retires from a conscious objectivity to a subconscious subjectivity. Little by little, we build over the surface of the past until this past seems to retire into an obscurity and darkness. Yet periodically and under certain pressureful circumstances, this past bursts through out of its own subjective darkness and has a distinct and definite bearing upon our present way of life. Some have held that Plato, under the fable of the lost Atlantis, uh, described the fall of man, or the fall or destruction of the golden age which preceded the present experience of mankind. Uh, he could only mean by this uh, the fall of man from a state of spiritual luminance into a state of material obscuration. That perhaps this fall of man is therefore the descent of the human being into the material world and the creation of a physical material dilemma in which his ancient a spiritually awakened state is no longer remembered by him. As the child coming into birth loses all many, any and all memory of a pre-existence, so man, gradually descending into materiality, loses likewise all record of any previous conscious experience. This in turn leads gradually to the fall of human consciousness into the darkness of material uh, embodiment. That the lost Atlantis, therefore, is the, the lost golden age, the lost better world that preceded the state we know. This brings us to a very interesting problem that has never also been well settled. And that is why history from the beginning, from all the history that we know, is always the history of the decline of peoples. Everything we pick up, every history that we read, is the history of something falling apart over great periods of time. Uh, when did Egypt rise? What history do we have of the magnificent ascendancy of Egypt? The first time Egypt comes to us, we find it already strewn with monuments to the heroic dead. Little by little, as, as Egypt's history unfolds, Egypt falls apart until finally it disappears as a powerful nation. What do we know of the history of the rise of China? What do we know of the great classical Chinese civilization that must have long preceded Confucius and Lao Tse? Nothing. We only pick up China misgoverned and badly managed, exploited and corrupted, and gradually falling apart under a succession of selfish or inadequate rulers. One dynasty after another, and in their arts the same. Where is the great art of China? The great art of China is prehistoric. The great art of China belongs to the dynasty of the Shan, and we have very little of it. This was the great classic period of somewhere between 4 or 500 and 12 or 1400 B.C. Then we come down a little later, and we have pretty good art in the Han Dynasty. Then we get some fairly good things, but not quite so good, in the Dynasty of the Wei. These dynasties early in the Christian centuries. Then comes a fine diffusion of art, but not quite so good, in the Tang Dynasty. The Tang Dynasty moves inevitably into the Sung, and things are getting worse artistically every minute. Finally, it collapses into the Ming Dynasty when art falls apart. So that today, art of a hundred years ago in China is for the most part totally uninspired. And art of three thousand years ago is the highest in China. Why? Why do these things always fall apart? If we go to Greece, we have no knowledge of, of the true culture of Greece except a few fragments. These fragments we know so little about that it was perfectly possible to fabricate a whole group of Etruscan antiquities and deceive the best curators in the museums of the world. That these ancient fabrications 
based upon fragments, were far better than anything produced in the classical period. Babylonian culture went to sleep almost before history began, as far as we are concerned. And we know that when the Spaniards reached the coast of uh, Central America, the Indians living there had already forgotten the builders of the great monument cities that dot that area. All these things belong to some other time, time that was sometime good, but little by little fell apart. What is the history of Europe but the history of a great continent falling apart, ethically, culturally, morally, and spiritually? until today we are truly at a very low ebb in all European consideration. If we want to look for anything that is interesting or important in Europe, we must go back to the Druids, to Stonehenge, to the monuments of Karnak in Brittany. We have to go back to the ancient Nordic mysteries, the Scythian invasions, the Phoenician merchants. There was where Europe was. It is true that culturally Europe was greater 500 years ago in some respects than it is today, but it was not too much even then. The great history of Europe is unknown. Back in the very dawn of things, there must have been and was great universities like Bibractus, where the Druid colleges were, and where men were measuring accurately the motions of the stars while most of what we call Europe was still in a hopelessly primitive state. Where were the beginnings of these things? Where were the great rises of empires? Where were the magnificent foundations of culture? Who taught the Egyptians their great philosophies? We don't know. Where did Orpheus come from? We don't know. Where did the great rites of Babylonia come from? We can only guess. What came before India? What before Persia? No one knows. Yet practically every institution that we know is born full, fully developed and matured, like Athena from the head of Zeus. These things do not quite fit together and make sense, but we are faced with them. And the uh, psychological possibility seems to be that there was, at the beginning of things, some kind of a tremendous dynamic. That this dynamic gradually, over a vast period of time, sank and is now utterly immersed under the surface of the dissonant, dissonant cultural fragments that we today call civilization. There are even traces of a world language now forgotten. There are evidences of world art. There is a great deal of proof of world navigation thousands of years ago. What was it all about? How did it happen? When did it happen? And why was all of this slowly and inevitably broken down? Until while we have a certain scientific achievement today, we have built our modern civilization not upon a magnificent monument, but upon a classic ruin. This. Uh, this is perhaps in some way related to the psychology of Atlantis. The psychology that somewhere there was the positive side of this thing we call culture. Whether we wish to assume that Atlantis was a place, or that we wish to assume that Atlantis was a state of consciousness, perhaps the thing we are seeking for, this rise of life, was never a physical thing at all. Perhaps this rise of life took place within man himself. Perhaps civilization rose in man and fell in the world which man fashioned. Perhaps the human being himself was the great reservoir of culture. It may well be, therefore, that this mysterious older time was a time in which man's consciousness was more free from the obsessions which now afflict it, and that man, growing, unfolding in the light of truth, achieved a great level of reason, and then reason prompting him to a series of material uh, achievements. Gradually, this reason was buried or drowned in the objective civilization which man attempted to build.
man shifted from the idea of evolution as unfoldment to the idea of evolution as amassment. And in this, his whole pattern of existence began to fall apart. So it's possible that this rise of empires was hidden inside or within the conscious unfoldment of collective humanity, even as the fall of empires is manifested outwardly in the institutions which man has fashioned. Certainly at some time we got off on the wrong foot and we have never been able to get back. But prior to that, perhaps we were on the right foot. And perhaps in this case, our great problem was that we were building great persons, unfolding great principles within ourselves by natural means. And somewhere along the line, this unfolding intelligence took the bit in its teeth and turned upon its own source, attempting to apply itself to the conquest of other things rather than to the continual unfoldment of its own nature. Such a psychological situation, did it arise in a person, would result in the same composite confusion that we seem to find traced in the civilization of our world. In any event, it's something that perhaps uh, we will find of interest if we consider it. We know that Lord Bacon was primarily an educator. We know that he attempted a complete restoration of the learning of the world. And we also know that in his entire concept he was moved by highly humanitarian motives. Bacon was undoubtedly of the opinion from his writings that we already possessed all that was necessary uh, to establish an enduring culture. That what we had to do, therefore, was to take what we knew and use it. It did not occur to him that we are in the presence of a great emergency in which the knowledge that we possess would be inadequate. I think also in the Instro Ratio Magna, particularly in that part which is called the Scala Intellectus, or the Ladder of the Mind, Bacon points out that there is no need for an emergency, that emergency thinking arises from breaking the proper sequence of mental development. In other words, there is no real reason why a world should ever be in crisis. The reason why it is in a critical state is because groups of persons or whole generations of persons neglect those forms of knowledge which prevent crisis, and therefore suddenly awaken in a critical situation, largely due to the neglect of common facts. <laughs>